Hello everyone and welcome to the UQ Biotechnologies Thermo Fisher Scientific Curious Panel. It's very wonderful to see you all here in the audience today and to see all of your engagement uh, with the society across the whole year. We had our industry night just last week and it was really, really positive to see all of your faces there and to see the engagement that you've all been having with us this year. Uh, we've really grown as a society so it's really great uh, to have all of you as part of this journey in really uh, helping to get you engaged with biotechnology in Southeast Queensland and within Brisbane. So in today's panel discussion, we've got two superstar women, part of the biotechnology uh, industry. We've got uh, Dr. Pervy Midwinter, who is an environmental account manager over at Thermo Fisher and Kim Baker, who's a general manager at Patheon. Uh, so yeah, without any further ado, I wanted to jump straight into their presentations. But before I do, I think it's very important that we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and the country that we are on. So I'm currently now in Brisbane, in uh, the country of the Turrbal and Yagara people. So I'd like to pay my respects and acknowledgement to the elders past, present and emerging and their contributions and, uh, and their connection to the land. And without any further ado, I'd like to jump on to uh, Dr. Purby Midwinter to introduce herself and her career in the biotechnology industry. Thank you, Vishak. It's absolutely honored to be here and support the society. So my presentation generally will focus on my life. I've had quite an extensive uh, career. I've lived in three different countries. I've had about, uh, I think, about 10, 10 jobs, and I've moved about over 20 times within uh, my, my lifetime. So I really want to share in snippets of what I've learned. And I'm generally speaking from perspectives of what skills I learned, life skills uh, from all these different uh, experiences. So Jack, do you want to mind the next slide, please? So I, I grew up in, in Kenya. So my journey started in, in Africa. Um, but as you can see, I'm, I'm brown. Um, but uh, so we've had uh, six generations in uh, East Africa. Um, my ancestors moved from the north of India uh, in, I think, the late 1700s. Both my parents are born in uh, uh, Kenya, Nairobi. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate uh, to, uh, you know, grow up in that country. My, my parents were both very well educated and, and sent us to some quite good schools. Um, and we studied through the English uh, syllabus. Um, and generally what happens is, you know, if you do come from a, a slightly well-off family, most of the, uh, sort of the, the students from the schools tend to go abroad, being England the closest place to uh, home. Uh, so I ended up in the UK. I studied uh, at the University of Bath. I did eight years um, studying chemistry. And, uh, and then I further moved on because I wanted to live in the country. I was, an, I was a highly skilled migrant and I moved around quite considerably to enhance skills and obviously get the rights to live in the, the country. And then finally, my last, I'll backtrack a bit. I haven't shown this on a map because it didn't fit, but I did spend some time in Canada as well. Um, this was part of an exchange program for a year during my master's degree of chemistry. And then uh, five years ago, moved to Australia, a regional town, if you know, um, I, I didn't know of it, uh, Bundaberg before I moved. Uh, moved there because of my husband's job. Um, and he's, he takes quite a significant part in my story because of him, I've had to move around quite a lot. But I'll, I'll share that in, in detail once we go through the slides. So I lived in Bundaberg for about, uh, let's say, two years and then moved again because my husband got another job uh, and um, I lived in, uh, now live in Brisbane. And in that time, I've had about five different jobs. Um, so, yeah. So if you can move to the next slide. So I wanted to just give you an overview, and I think you know everybody sort of puts their uh, journey into sort of blocks of, of age, and what what do you learn during those 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 times of of your life? And 
and I can remember a, a, a lot of uh, sort of key events during these periods of my life, and there were key events that really changed of how I, um, you know, managed my career, how I developed as a person, and you know how I how I connected with other people because that is what who we are. We are sort of, you know, human beings which need that connection, and that sort of helped me grow in in my journey so I started with my early childhood as I gave a brief introduction in Kenya and then I moved to university which was a very narrow road I, I didn't have a gap year I just continued on with education and then my life started to become quite uh and sort of diverse after I got married, which usually does. Um, and I had a lot of exposure, um, you know, being a working mum. And then it was a journey back into work, what I learned during that period, and then moving to Australia. So I've been an immigrant now for over 20 years. I have got three passports. I can drop one passport, but so I've got a very complicated identity. So trying to fit in, um, you know, in different uh, countries, you know, managing the work ethic. So this became quite uh, prevalent while I moved to Australia. And now where am I now? And I think what insights I want to share in terms of what I've learned. If you can move to the next slide, please. So I grew up in Nairobi, the capital city. I studied in uh, a private school. And in this school, uh, it was a, a generally uh, a sort of British Cambridge system. So we'd have a lot of um, expat teachers. So we were taught, as you may have noticed, I speak quite well because I was taught in a very structured manner uh, growing up. Um, and the main focus was obviously to do, you know, I, I don't know what you've got in Australia. Please forgive me, I, don't, I haven't really explored there, but we did our standard O levels and A levels. You choose your subjects based on what you're going to uh, do in your career. Whereas I was quite different. I did, uh, I chose subjects, which I really enjoyed. My parents couldn't understand that. Uh, they thought, you know, you need to choose a subject which will give you a job. Um, but I was always quite rebellious from quite a young age. I had a very creative aspect to me, which really wasn't encouraged because growing up, I don't know if you relatable, uh, a very close family, culturally uh, focused in terms of, you know, you've got to do science and really be at the top of your class, a very high achieving family. So I did my O levels and then I chose my A levels, which is uh, I chose four subjects and I did biology, chemistry, literature and music. And mom and dad would ask me, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I just want to really you know, do something that I really am passionate about. And I was really passionate about science. And the reason I'm so passionate is that I can like to understand how things work. Um, and I, I, I still have, you know, I have a very analytical mind generally in my day-to-day -day life, but I wanted to apply that in my career. So I thought chemistry was very good and I had a fantastic teacher. So that resonated for me from, you know, when I was 18. So I chose my subject. If you can move to the next slide. And I got, I was very fortunate to get a place in the University of Bath. Um, and I did mention in my last slide, I think the social aspect did contribute quite a lot in my life experience because I grew up in quite a close community. Um, Bath was very, uh, it's very white, you know, generally people who studied in Bath would come from the, from the region. So I had to really adapt to that different culture. But I, I did my... Um, uh, master's in chemistry. I did that for four years and then I, I, I was really interested in inorganic chemistry. And even at this point, I was 22, I still didn't know what to do. My mom and dad said to me, you, you shouldn't really do a doctorate because you need to get a job and get married. I said, no, I'm going to do a doctorate so I can delay that, that prospect. And I just did that for my own, uh, you know, uh, reasons. However, the passion was still there. I really enjoyed uh, research. So I continued on to do a PhD and I was fortunate to get a scholarship with uh, Unilever. And I was working um, in their division, microbiology division, looking at antibacterial agents in toothpaste formulation. So I did three and a half years studying toothpaste. 
and I learned a lot about toothpaste. I learned about the history, I learned about you know, the chemical properties, but I also learned about the innovative side. Um, I have what uh, you know, antibacterial agents uh, can be used instead of potentially carcinogenic uh, agents like triclosan. So I did that um, for, uh, my whole study was about eight years, continued on in Bath, and then it was time to get a job. Um, if you can move to the next slide. I think I graduated from my doctorate when I was 27. I was very fortunate to continue to stay on in the country. I didn't want to go back to Kenya. So I got a very, um, basic job working as a, a sort of a technician in a in a very small family business called Chemovation. It was very, very intense in terms of the practical, it is practical skills, you know, chromatography, uh, um, LCMS. Uh, and then I started to learn that this is actually not who I am because I love people. I absolutely love engaging. I love talking. I love presenting. Whereas working in Chemovation was, it was quite isolating. Um, but that business unfortunately didn't uh, succeed and I was made redundant. So that gave me opportunities to look elsewhere. And I decided to uh, shift my perspective and started to look for jobs which I could expose myself to a commercial environment. And I was fortunate to get a job in a Japanese automotive trading company. So if you notice, the theme is getting more different as you know the jobs I got. I really never, I still, I think now I'm 42. Now I feel I finally found my, my feet. So I was 29, I think, uh, when I got this job at Toyota Tusho. It was a lot of uh, administrative work, but I learned a lot. I learned about the logistics. I learned about purchase orders, invoices, um, but I was quite mature compared to my peers. Um, so it was peak recession and I thought I need a change. Um, but this time I had the rights to live in the country. I got my highly skilled migrant visa um, through my own credentials. I feel quite proud saying that I didn't get married to get it. So I did this on my own accord. And then I got um, an interview with a you know, multinational company selling starch um, in different sectors, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, food and beverage, uh, animal feed and industrial. And I was fortunate to land up in a, in a job. Um, I was fairly young in this job to my peers, which was the opposite to what I was exposed to at my previous role. It was generally middle-aged men who would have business degrees. I had a doctorate in chemistry, extremely ambitious and very driven. So I spent four years in this organization and I absolutely loved it. I was exposed to different cultures. We would spend um, every quarter with my European colleagues. Uh, we would share our market data, competitive analysis and our old business plans. And I really learned how to be a leader in my own right. I was, I started to manage people. I was about, let's say 29. Um, and then I met my beautiful husband who it was at the time my neighbor. Um, and it was a pure love story. I was encouraged, I'd use that word quite lightly by my parents, it's time to get married. Um, I did go through the traditional routes, but I fell in love with the man next door. Um, and in this, my whole life changed. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So this is Mark. Uh, he's actually, he'd be quite embarrassed me sharing this, but he's actually a professor at UQ. He's a, a professor of chemical anatomy and the, I think the deputy head of the biomedical sciences school. So he's got a very um, sort of complex life himself. As you notice with his uniform, he's, uh, he was uh, Navy. Um, he was surgeon captain Mark Midwinter, a trauma surgeon, and um, I, I got uh, sort of caught with Mark and uh, we got married, uh, but there was another complication uh, in terms of him going away on deployment to Afghanistan. And, but it was quite simple because we both had quite busy lives. So we generally meet, you know, hotels on the motorway because we would travel quite a lot. We didn't have the added factor of children at that time. 
Uh, but we got married. We had the traditional Hindu wedding as well as a Christian wedding. Um, and then I had Aiden, and I still was working at Rocket during this time. I had Aiden uh, fairly soon after we got married. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And uh, and yeah, it's it's lovely, it's good memories. And we, I had Aiden straight after we got married, and there were complications in that, in terms of that Mark had to go to deployment when Aiden was only four weeks old. I went back to Kenya um, with a young baby for nearly four months. I really lost my identity as a very driven, ambitious. I was somebody who, you know, they always say that, you know, somebody who really desperately wants a child. I was the opposite. I got pregnant very quickly. So it was quite a shock to me and I think adjusting to the other factors in my life that made it really really difficult so this really played quite a significant part in my growth um, because I had to step up I had to look after somebody else and I had to look after somebody else when my husband was at war um, so it was really challenging um, but we reconnected after four months uh, we we uh, we got back uh, to sort of some sort of normality. I, I looked for um, a, a job um, and, and then we sort of started to build our lives again as, as working parents. If you can move to the next slide. So my, my job was a part-time job. I was working for uh, another small family business, very accommodating. Um, and would, would suit my, my hours and supporting Aiden going into um, in daycare at, at the time. And then Mark unfortunately had some uh, uh, complicated health issues during his uh, deployment and that resulted him in reducing his duties. So we thought this is an opportunity for us to do something quite different. And this is when we made the decision to move to Australia. So Mark moved to, uh, Mark got appointed as a physician, as a surgeon at the Bundaberg Base Hospital. Uh, we moved together in June 2016. And I think at that time, it was my priority to set up home, uh, you know, support Aidan going to the new school, um, and also starting to establish a social network. And I slowly started to tap into looking for work, but it wasn't my priority at that time. Can move to the next slide, please? So I, I started, I thought it was a September, I think about six months without a job. Uh, Aiden was settled, Mark was working, you know, ridiculous hours as a, as a general surgeon. So I said, I need a life. I need to get something that will give my identity back. So I looked for work. It was quite challenging because Bundaberg is quite remote. And most of the work that is focused is on generally tourism and farming. So I had never worked in... Um, in a food uh, industry. So I thought, let me start from some, I really want to learn about the region. So I got a job um, working as a, a lab scientist in the, the famous chili farm in, uh, in Vanderburg. I always say to people that Queensland beat the princess out of me because I really got my hands dirty and I you know, really was into you know, in, uh, helping with the farm, with the, the chilies and but I had that job for about three months. Uh, I thought I need to do something which is more constructive. So I got um, another job uh, working in the ginger beer factory. And this was back to science again. And I was an innovation scientist supporting with new product yeah. development or any quality issues that you know, the, the ginger beer or its uh, products would experience. If you can move to the next slide. And Mark, Mark then decided to leave uh, surgery and I thought, oh God, we've got to move again. So I think in Australia that time, we'd only, we'd moved about five times. Um, and then even within Brisbane, we'd moved about six times. So it's, it's been quite a lot of moving. So we moved to Brisbane, as you can see that beautiful jacaranda. I love the colors of uh, UQ. So Mark got a job at UQ and Aiden was in a good school and I thought I need to really start building my, my career. But what I learned about this time is, is how to interact with people. And I think what I sort of appreciated is the connections you make with people. That's how you get your jobs. And that's how you feel engaged and motivated in you know, building your personal brand and also providing that home environment that you know if you do move around a lot it, it does it does lack initially 
So I'd really focused on those key areas. Um, I got uh, I got a job uh, at ALS, uh, Australian Laboratory Services. Um, I was working as a business development officer. And from that job, I really built my personal brand. I was really focused on um, supporting the industry. So what my job was to, um, to uh, promote ALS. So we would get uh, businesses like, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the likes of GHD, ACOM, big uh, environmental consultancies to sell, uh, to provide their water samples and soil samples for analysis uh, prior to construction uh, projects or um, projects like remediation if the land is contaminated with a particular toxin. Uh, it was my job to provide that service as we do the, the testing for these uh, particular uh, you know, uh, 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 contaminants within soil and, and water. Um, and at this time, I also got quite heavily involved with UQ. I supported the industry with uh, mentoring and, and presenting for that. Um, a COVID hit, and that's another time where I thought this is quite an interesting time because I missed that connection with, uh, with the people. And I think there's this called the great resignation. There's a lot of people that who really came about to thinking, I need a job that has got purpose. And this is when I applied for the job at um, Thermo Fisher. Uh, I started in January last year, and I've absolutely loved this job. It's like, um, I don't know. It's it's sort of I found my my place. I'm I'm able to use my technical knowledge to such a high standard, but also being able to uh, you know enjoy the the aspect of interacting with other people because I sell I sell products to the environmental industry, um, and that that's my my main focus. Can we move to the next slide, please. So. That's my, my short, I think hopefully a short story, but you know, when, when you go to these sort of presentations, I always think, you know, they, they, you, you talk about how to write a CV, that's quite theoretical, what's practical, what do you do with your day to day? So I really came up with these three um, key uh, sort of uh, ideas because they really had an impact on me. Now this may not resonate with you, now, but it may do, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, or it may resonate with you supporting somebody, you know, who's going through a sort of an identity crisis, or I don't know what to do with my life. So I really focused on these key areas, emotional and cultural intelligence. The world is a very small place. And I think now we're really focusing on how to bring out the best in somebody. I really, really celebrate neurodiversity. We're all very different. And how do we work with each other to bring out, you know, the best positive outcome? Patience, I always say you start badly, always start badly. And once you build that confidence, you keep repeating yourself, you work, you know, you can be able to excel at a particular skill. Now, be it running, be it, you know, analytical skills, I don't know, but always start and never put that as a barrier, thinking I'm not going to succeed. And that sort of combines with grit. There's going to be lots of failure, there's going to be real hardships. I think once you go out of university, you're exposing yourself to quite a, it's a challenging world out there. And I think because of these recent events, it makes it a little bit more harder. But I think having grit and how you manage that grit definitely contributes in your motivation to succeed. A very important one is connection, meaning and purpose. I found this at about 42. Uh, it can be now for you, it can be later, I don't know. But it's having meaning and doing things with your core values. If you do that, it makes you happy. Happy is quite a simple word, but you actually feel it. I do believe in that sensation of feeling. And once you do that, you're able to engage your creative side and you work better and you have a better flow in your uh, work and personal life. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Midwinter. That was a very, very inspirational story. And I'm sure all the people in the audience would have really learned a lot from your story when it comes to resilience, grit, patience, learning about the power of education and family and connection. So it was really, really wonderful to hear that presentation from you. And thank you so much. Uh, for your engagement with our society across the year uh, with all of the mentorship that you're doing with our society and being part of these events. 
Um, it's been really wonderful and I'm sure it's going to help every single member of the audience today. Lovely. Um, Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, for the next presentation today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kim Baker from Thermo Fisher Pathion, the general manager at Thermo Fisher Pathion, uh, to share a little bit about her life story and some of the lessons that she's learned along the way. Thanks, Vishak, and um, hi, everyone. It's great to talk to you today. So I'll start by saying it's absolutely brilliant that um, Pervy started off because by the time we get to our last slide, um, Pervy talked about the need to lead with empathy and how important that is in teamwork and collaboration. So that's exactly why Pervy's gone first because she's full of empathy and um, much better at it than I am. So who am I? Um, and what's Pathian? I think those many of you may have attended the Biotech Society event, so you know a little bit of what we do. I'll talk about that in more detail. But essentially, my job, I'm responsible for about 205 people, two buildings, a big revenue target, and manage up to about 40 clients a year delivering life-saving medicines to the clinic. So let's hear how I got there. Next slide, please, Vishak. Um, just to talk who we are, this is an example of our um, downstream, so purification clean rooms. We are a large scale contract manufacturing and development organization, and we develop and manufacture parenteal drug substance. That means not by mouth, um, but liquid med medicine uh, generally injected direct or into an IV giving set in a hospital situation. And we make those products protein biotherapeutics for mammalian cell cultures. Think of us as high-tech brewers um, that then highly purify the product, this humanized like product, so it's ready for injection. Next slide. And what we do here at Pathian is just a tiny, tiny fraction of this whole life cycle of getting a medicine to the clinic. So um, I've just highlighted this one little bit. But everything we do from this molecular side through to the medicine at the um, bedside is really about focusing with the patient in mind. Next slide. Okay, so who am I? This is where you get to laugh. So I started my university career in 1988, and this is my graduation photo from the biotech program. We were the first year that ever got guinea pig tested into a biotech degree. At that point, it was a third chem -eng, a third biochem, and a third microbiology. I can tell you I love the chem -eng, I love the micro, really not such a fan of the biochem, but you gotta stick with it, hey? Um, I took the opportunity just because my colleagues around me did it, and I went, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea, and did summer studentships whenever I could. And out of that, I had a tremendous failure trying to work with PCR, QPCR, which is really new technology um, in the late 80s. And as a point of that, I developed Touchdown QPCR, and that's now in one of the most um, procedures in the National Academy of Sciences, actually one of the most um, top 100 cited papers in biology, and purely by accident and total failure in the lab. So don't ever worry about failure. You learn a lot, and sometimes good things come of it. I then did um, first um, honours in chemical engineering, developing blue tongue virus vaccines for agriculture using insect cell culture. And this is where I really got the bug of this whole, what we could use biotech for to make a difference, whether it was in agriculture or in medicine and fell in love with um, wanting to be, you know, work with bioreactors forever. But at the end of honours, um, I then, I'll talk about that in a minute, but I did what all good students who can't find a job do, which is go and do a PhD. So I then did a PhD and developed antibody vaccines to actually control feral rabbit populations because deep at heart, I was a bit of a softy for our native species and saw the impact of feral animal populations. Um, so I did that down at ANU with CSIRO then went on and did some postdocs because I couldn't find a job in Australia again. And in fact, had got so sick of 
um, being in Australia want to go somewhere else. So did three postdocs before I moved into industry, but actually the postdocs were industry focused with collaborations with industry and actually involved a year sabbatical in industry, which that was it. I was never going back to academia again after that. Next slide. So what got me to where I am today? It really is, if people tap you on the shoulder and said, have you considered, or I, I really think you should apply for that, please listen to them because at least what I see now um, is that people often see your strengths in a very different way to what you perceive them to be at your point in time. So if people say, have you considered applying for that role? That's because they believe you're going to be really successful in that role and you'd do a great job. So listen to your taps on the shoulders. What that meant for me is when I first joined industry, I did 13 different roles in that 15 years across five different very disparate areas. So I started I applied for a role in cell culture development. I got offered a role in analytical development because when you're doing a PhD, you're going to do all your own analytics as well as your tests. So I kind of knew something about it. So then from there, I got moved to fix problems. So this might be a recurring thing. One of the things you learn from your PhD is how to problem solve. So you can take that skill set and fix problems. And when you're successful, you get moved to fix another problem somewhere else. What that meant is I got to see so much variety and got so much experience in the 15 years I was in um, industry, working across R&D, working in manufacturing and manufacturing science and technology on process tech transfer, um, QC, um, I said I was bored one day and got moved into a position that took me five years to get out of again. So be careful with saying you're bored unless you're really ready for another move. Um, but yeah, just got so much experience there in different roles. And that really set me up to be headhunted back to Australia um, to run Pathian, which is now part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. And why was I headhunted? because people who had worked with me in the previous company knew I had that experience. So I was asked to apply, got through, and here I am today. What all of those different roles has given me is personally, if we look at the biologics that are approved on the market, those human therapeutic drugs, cancer therapies, rheumatoid arthritis, COVID therapies, I have personally work with about a third of them, which is an awful lot of protein experience. Um, and that is really great because I get to ask my teams loads of really challenging questions every day. So when things don't go to plan, and they don't always go to plan, is have you considered, have we looked at, have we looked at that? Tell me about this. What did we see? Blah, blah, blah. And I get to ask a million questions because that's a really fun part of my job. Um, who am I as a person? I didn't show photos of hubby, but I am married. I am mortgaged. I have two kids, one in high school, one at university, um, who said not in a million years will I ever do science, but she is becoming a vet. So she's kind of a scientist. Um, and two dogs of which um, I have had to put them outside because one is absolutely psychotic. So that's me. Next slide. So I thought it might be useful, and this backtracks back to the early 90s again. So um, when I was doing my PhD, and this is my lovely lab manager, Hannah Clark, she now runs IVF Australia based out of Canberra. And we were trying to develop vaccines to stop fertilization. So you can tell why that was a good fit for her for her next job as well. So. It doesn't really matter if you choose to do a PhD or not. These days, it doesn't matter. I would say perhaps 30 years ago, yeah, maybe it helped. But I did it because I couldn't find a job. I was jobless. The, there are political things that happened where the biotech market was booming. Political changes happened. And all of this um, investment from the government in biotech disappeared. 
So we saw the biotech um, sort of, which at the time was on par with the US. I have to say this because it was such a detriment to Australia that we lost that opportunity. But nonetheless, the biotech market died. So I did what all jobless students do and continued studying. But as I said before, what we get out of it, it's the complex problem solving and data analysis. It's the teamwork and collaboration. And Pervy touched on this, it's resilience. And I term it what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I'll talk about some of the challenges I've experienced and um, somewhat female, but let's just say I didn't take them lightly. It's kind of who I am. I am the daughter of a feminist. So um, that was a challenge growing up in 1970s and early 80s in Australia. But after three or four years, I really had itchy feet to travel. I just wanted to get out of there. And I really knew I hated basic research. Um, my brain would move in 100 miles an hour ahead of where my hands were able to actually achieve stuff. And that really, really frustrated me. So I knew I didn't want to continue doing basic research. Um, so what I did about it is I ensured when I looked for postdocs that they were industry sponsored and aligned uh, because I couldn't get, wait to get back into making stuff to solve a problem. And I do want to stress, even today, you do not need a PhD to get a hidden industry. But I am aware, and I'm not going to name and shame that there are some companies still that prefer that you have a PhD if you want to get into senior management positions. Personally, within Thermo Fisher Scientific, um, you do not, I definitively do not need a PhD to get ahead. Um, if you are a lab-based person with good problem-solving skills and three years experience, you're the same as a PhD graduate. So please do not underestimate, um, you know, your life experiences as important. Next slide. All right. So this is me. And this is actually a photo taken out of the house and the um, window at the top. Typical little two up, two down British house um, is when I was doing my sabbatical in Oxford and I loved every minute of that. And that was it. I got the industry bug. Um, and for those that attended the other night, you will also know that I had 32 rejection letters before I got my first interview in industry. So resilience is important. Do not give up because I'm a GM today and I got 32 rejection letters before I even got my first interview. In hindsight, I think if I didn't hand in an academic CV to every um, industry application I went to, maybe those odds might have changed. So really Google industry CV and really streamline it, focusing on soft skills and skill sets you'll offer as opposed to this is my paper on this. This is my, I don't care about people's papers. When you write a paper um, comment for an industry CV, just say um, three papers available, details available on request. Maybe we'll ask you, maybe we won't. All right, so what are some of the challenges? Hopefully 30 years on, you're not gonna see any of these. But sexism and inequality in some areas, especially in academia, I think UQ's done an amazing job coming forward these days, but sometimes it still raises its head. So I'm just going to share Chemi chemical engineering. Now, this uh, lecture is long gone. Um, used to start every lecture where I was the only female in his engineering class of 30 miles with a sexist joke of the day. Don't worry, I'm not a wallflower. He was from New Zealand. I started every day with a different sheep joke on the board to retaliate. So, you know, give back what you get. He couldn't complain about me because then it would have been found out and he probably would have been fired. So resilience is really important. Honours, three weeks work down the tube. I'm running an uh, SDS page gel to separate my proteins on my blue tongue um, virus vaccine. And I come back to find my gel's been disconnected partway through. 
and to find that a PhD student had connected his analysis up. When I asked why did he disconnect it, he just had to wait an hour. He said, my work's more important and as a man, I have priority. Well, I did do the right thing and went through my um, honours supervisor and asked him to have a little chat because that wasn't acceptable in 1980s Brisbane. Um, my supervisor kind of didn't see why I was so upset. So I actually sacked him, went to the head of the department and got him to be my supervisor. So don't take anything lying down. If your gut tells you things aren't right and conditions aren't right, please do something about it. These are just specific examples. My favorite, my PhD supervisor told me I had to sleep with the right people to get ahead. Uh, that was a classic. So he actually went before an arbitration board and I lost that case for sexual harassment. Um, however, three or four students later, he finally got sacked for exactly the same thing for three or four future students as well. So um, don't worry if you don't win at first because guaranteed bad eggs do get chucked out with rubbish eventually. All right, so fast forward, I'm in the UK university system. And without me really noticing, you know, my uh, professor was moving on to a new role. I was running the lab. I was running his master's course. I was giving his lectures uh, because he mumbled and they much preferred that I did that. I was doing all his marking. I was helping with his grants. So when he chose to move on, I applied to take over his um, you know, lecturer, senior lecturer position there at the university and rightly um, rejected fairly much immediately. And they gave the role to a brand new MSc graduate who had zero lab running experience. And then I looked around and I was bitching one day and someone said, do you not notice there are no other female lab heads in this department? Females are only allowed to teach. Oh, so that really made me want to get out of the labs and um, really go into industry as well. I had an interview three weeks after I had miscarried my first child for a woman. So it's not just male on female um, inequality, a woman that said, don't you even think about getting pregnant on my watch? Well, you can imagine the impact on someone who at that stage had very wanted that baby that I lost and to be told that it was sort of like, there is no way in hell I wanna work here and I definitely don't wanna work with you. Anyway, long story short, moved into industry, loved every moment and have never looked back. Next slide. All right, so I'm often asked the question, how do I know if I wanna work in R&D or in industry? or in academia or industry? Well, they're very similar, okay? They're just different as well. So choose what suits your strength. So if we look at industry, you may look research multiple topics or in academia, you're working on a single topic. In industry, it's usually applied. We're trying to get something we can sell to the public or that the market wants. Whereas an academia, you may just go, oh, I'm really keen to understand how this works. So if you care about how things work and getting to the bottom of a problem, academia is great for you. Because in industry, the hardest thing I had to learn was the 80-20 rule, okay? You are paid to be good enough to sell the product. Whereas I'd come from academia was, no, it's got to be squeaky clean, 100% right. No, you are not paid to be 100% perfect in industry. It's, is it good enough? Move on. So that's something to really think about if you want to move from academia into industry. In industry, goals are aligned to market and go through stage gating. It's good to fail fast, whereas in academia, you'll probably keep following that thread along till you get to an absolute um, failure or you go, hey, this thread's running out, but this thread looks interesting. Let's go and follow that one down. 
and novel research really fuels directions in industry. So we, we absolutely need academia and work with them together. What we might do in industry though, is take that novel research and go, hmm, I wonder if I applied this to this problem, would it work? Now, everything in industry, and you've heard this through Pervy's talk, it's about collaboration and teamwork and really working in those team environments. Whereas often in academia, you're rewarded for working in isolation or in small team or labs. And the time pressures therefore are impacting those small number of people and it's all about your grant timelines. It's still really high pressure, but it's to different timelines. In industry, that time pressure, you could have you know, 200 people at one time working on one thing and everyone is just time pressured to get the same result because those projects could be multi-billion dollar projects. Whereas in academia, you know, something goes wrong. Yeah, well, we can change tack and hopefully, you know, that hundreds of thousands to million dollar projects will still go really successfully. Except for grant time and except for when that money is running out from the grant, generally academia, you can work in a slightly less pressurized environment. Whereas in industry, tend to be high pressure volatile environments. And, you know, as a CDMO and we work with our clients, it's really hard when you see, oh, they failed their phase 2B clinical trial, they didn't meet their clinical endpoint. And then the people you've been working with for three years gone, their jobs are gone. So in that way, you know, fail early, get out fast. These jobs can pay well, but they also can disappear overnight as well. Strong organisational skills are imperative in whatever role you're in, whether it's academia or industry, that is a definitive um, asset and one of the benefits of academia is being a government job there is slow and steady career advancement but you get a guaranteed pay rise as a tenured academic every year but the average primary grant holder i.e that professor age is 42 and what we know is only three percent of people who start off in that higher degree doing honours or masters or going on to PhD actually stay in academia to become those primary grant holders long term. So there is a need to consider different career pathways unless you are absolutely committed to that academic pathway. But you are guaranteed a pay rise every year and um, but on the downside there are less and less tenured roles coming through and available in university every year as well. On the flip side, in industry, it really is a pay for performance. So no payment is ever guaranteed, although you usually get a pay rise every year. It is more based on inflation rather than an arbitrary government amount. But those who shine out, those who go the extra mile and really shine out can advance very rapidly and get paid very well. And that could be as a technical SME or it could be in a leadership role. And I will be delighted when I am replaced by someone in their 30s. That's going to rock my boat that that happens. And we're working really hard towards that. And I can see potential in a number of people that are perhaps graduate, less than five years, that I think, I think they could do my job in the future. Let's hone their experience and their abilities, tapping them on the shoulder to saying, we'd like you to go and try that because we see that potential where perhaps their um, life experience hasn't let them see that yet. Um, but on a positive note, in industry, there are many permanent positions that readily are available. I will touch on a question I am often asked, which is if I'm a not an Australian citizen or a permanent residency, what does that mean for me? 
Typically, if you look at Australian law, what that means is you need to go and apply for fixed term contract positions. Most companies in Australia will not offer you a permanent position without a permanent visa. But once you have that permanent residency, you are eligible to then go and apply for permanent positions. But don't think, oh, I'm not going to get a permanent job. What we do is we really look at our high performing fixed term contractors and go, do you know what? They're really good. We roll those contracts over and over until their residency is approved. And then they flip over and we offer them permanent roles. So don't be put off um, if you're not yet a permanent residency, but are getting close in the next few years. Next slide. If you just double click, there's another one. So where could you work? We have a lot of different roles. So within Paytheon, we have the development side. Now, actually, development for us is not in Brisbane. It's supported in the US, in China, and in Switzerland as well, which is really doing the molecular biology and the cloning through cell line development and process scale up. Um, and also the development of the analytical assays that go with it. But what we do do on site is the scale up and large scale commercial production of the biotheric proteins, and then the downstream processing, which is the removal of the cells. So I think clarified beer in your head, but from mammalian cells making human proteins. And then we highly purify those using a couple of techniques so they're safe to be injected into humans. But although that's the main kind of production side, we are supported by so many critical roles on site that make up sort of the other half of the staff, if you say. Media buffer prep. To make one 2,000 litre reactor takes on average 26 tonnes of media and buffer. And as I said to the Biotech Society a few days ago, Making a ton of buffer is not as simple as making a leader in the lab. So a really specialized team there. And often it's an entry point. If you don't have much experience, you could be going into the media and buffer prep team, get that experience and then move on into upstream or downstream development. We have a great um, engineering maintenance and validex. Our equipment, everything we do is to GMP, good manufacturing practice, which means everything needs to tick the box, written down, and everything's calibrated and validated. Um, so we know we can trust whatever comes out of the instrument. So we have a big team that work on that. And then we have um, QC. QC test everything. They test the incoming raw materials, they test the air, they take swabs of the surfaces because we work in a clean room environment, they test all the in-process samples, and then they test the final product to show that it's safe for injection into humans. And then QA, we are trying to move that water paper into computers and less of printouts, but that amount of paper shows how much paperwork goes into one single batch to show to the regulators that it's safe for injection into humans. Do you magnify that by, you know, 40, 60, 100 batches? That's a lot of paperwork we deal with. What I say to people is if you have natural OCD tendencies, QA is the role for you because it's really about verifying, checking, and making sure that we've done the right thing. And it really is isn't a policing attitude. It's working with the team to say, hey, we've got a problem. Yeah, this is the way we need to uh, work through that. And according to the regulations, perhaps we need to capture the information in this format. And really supporting all the teams, both in QC and in manufacturing that way. Then logistics, materials and handling. Now, planning for and we have about 2,000 different raw materials at any one time um, that go into our processes. Given COVID and restrictions, to put in perspective, my head of supply chain who looks after this team is managing $60 million worth of plastics and raw materials. 
to keep our processes running every single day and critically pulling and pushing to make sure we've got what we need delivered to plant to do that day's activities. So quite a few exciting roles in that area as well. And especially in that more IT um, space as well. And then of course we have the money guys. So we have project management who actually manage and make sure the proteins um, are manufactured to the right schedule and we're meeting our customer demands and the business management handling the contracts, handling money negotiations as well. So loads of different varieties of roles on site. Next slide. I realize I'm talking too much. Key skill sets, customer focus in everything we do. Take accountability and ownership for what you're accountable for and for the results you're delivering. We don't have a blame culture, but we expect people to deliver. And we expect people to come up with a better way every day. Drive, let's find a better way to do these processes, but we're going to do it in a controlled manner. And to live up to our core values, we really act with integrity and trust, intensity, striving for great results. But we also value out of the box thinking and really work to improve our processes and systems, but people to be involved, be engaged and partake in positive culture setting. Sound exciting? Well, Check out the thermofisher.com website for roles. There are loads of jobs there. Um, we may be in Paytheon hiring up to 60 to 80 people this year. So watch this space. Um, they should start coming on board. Internships, we do offer them. We do prefer longer placements. Um, and what we're looking for, team players, collaborators, network, emotional intelligence, all the things Pervy talk to, we're looking for it. And don't underestimate your jobs in um, Big M or KFC because they count. When you work in those environments, they're in um, high safety conditions, you're managing money, so you, someone's trusted you, you're talking to clients, so you get that client experience. You have to work in a team to get those McDonald's out on time. So you get a lot of skills from those jobs that perhaps when you're doing them, you don't really appreciate it. Your CV gets you the interview. Choose the keywords in the job and make sure you're highlighting them in your CV. Google industry CV and reformat it because you're not going for an academic job in industry. And really, that CV gets you the interview. In the interview, it's then you that gets you the job. All right, I've talked too long. Thanks, Fisher. Thank you so much for that, Kim. And it's a very inspiring story of yours and uh, one that I'm sure all our members can really learn from uh, to see how you used resilience and you didn't really take anything from anyone uh, all throughout your journey. So I think it's a really valuable lesson to every one of our members and everyone in the audience today. Uh, and I am aware of time, but I do want to give the opportunity to all of our members to ask questions uh, to both yourself and Dr. Midwinter. So if you're both happy, I'm happy to extend the session for a little bit longer for Q&A. And if every one of you in the audience, if you have questions, if you could please put it in the chat, would that be okay with yourself, Kim and Dr. Midwinter? Absolutely. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, so I had a question, Kim, that did come into the chat earlier. Uh, and this was a question regarding uh, the salaries of internship of uh, industry versus academia. And the question asks, so are pays generally higher in the biotech industry or academia uh, at all these varied positions? Um, I'd say up to a certain level, they're actually about the same. Yeah, really wonderful. And another question, uh, Dr. Midwinter, that I had for you arising from your uh, presentation. So early on in your presentation, you mentioned that when you were little, you really liked creativity and you liked to embrace uh, being creative in all of your subjects. And I wanted to follow up and ask, uh, in your current position, being uh, obviously focused in science and having a very yes. formulaic outlook, what process or what role does creativity play? Oh, there's a, as soon as I love that, there's, there's so much opportunity 
Um, so I, I don't know if you, I did put up a, a video of myself uh, to take part in the global video. That really, you know, to, um, to, to for quite an extreme to become creative, you know, um, that project was something that I've never been exposed to. And I think the company provide different avenues. You know, we have internal podcasts, we have opportunities to write articles. Um, so I really tap into those areas. And, you know, it's quite uh, insightful to hear uh, Kim's perspective because I've moved around so much. I really focus on areas that I lead sideways. Um, that, that really means I look at, you know, opportunities where I can enhance my uh, creative skills by either mentoring or taking part in you know, videos or presenting in podcasts. Um, and this company, like I said, I feel very, very fortunate that it provides its employees with that diverse range of uh, opportunities. Yeah, amazing answer. So thank you uh, for that, Dr. Midwinter. And another question that has just come through in the chat uh, was, uh, was a student who wanted to know uh, what positions are available to engage in international markets uh, as a long-term goal at Thermo Fisher and Thermo Fisher Pathion for a PhD graduate who is bilingual in uh, English and Mandarin? Well, let me give an example. I have a lovely um, postdoc who has worked for me for a few years. We took on a project with a Chinese company and we sent her to China to work with the client and do the translation of their process um, while she saw the process in action. So we were able to delight this client by getting 100% perfect tech transfer because we took someone who understood their culture and their language to them and hand delivered it um, to them and back to us. So she is a, one of our poster childs and really says, hey, we can offer you that personalized cultural service because we understand how to work with you in your culture. One other highlight and use the Thermo Fisher website, we are opening a massive site in the um, Hangzhou region about an hour out of Shanghai in uh, the second half of this year. And we are actively recruiting there now. Yeah. So loads of opportunities, whether you start in Australia and move back to China, if you want to go home, or if you want to um, think about going to work for Thermo Fisher in China, there's loads of opportunities. Wonderful. And I think it'll be really great for students to get this international exposure to how biotech um, is and the industry is like all across the world. So thank you, Kim, for that. Another question uh, coming in the chat now is, is it common for undergraduate students to be doing an internship while they're still studying and to be doing an internship at Thermo Fisher? Yes, yeah, so we have both um, higher degree and undergraduate internships that we do offer throughout different parts of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, some of them are graduate, some are undergraduate. What we say is you really need to work with the university and understand what's possible as part of your um, degree uh, with the graduate school. And then once you understand what the graduate school needs from you, um, you send us our CV, tell us what we need to do. One of the caveats I will say for Patheon is we look for long internships, by which I mean three to six months which may not always be conducive with your studying. But we have taken um, internships that have been three to four days a week over a longer extended period. Say you um, eased out your study because you didn't want to do 10 subjects to get your um, number of points up on a semester. So you've decided to ease that over an additional semester as part of your degree. And in that final semester, maybe you're only doing two subjects and have less contact time. That's an example where that situation could work. But check with grad school, um, check what's possible with your course directors. And yeah, we're, we are not um, ageist when it comes to where our interns are coming from. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much uh, for that, Kim. And another question that's 
coming into the chat now, how would you recommend getting your foot in the door in an industry career? And what are the types of roles new graduates should be looking for when they go on job seeking websites? Everything. Try everything. Just go for it. Um, there's been a lot of ramp up in the industry in the last year. And I'd say with the downsizing of some universities, we've been very lucky to get experienced candidates in the door. But we know that pool is um, fairly exhausted. And so is it exhausted at other companies as well. But try for the summer scholarships, try for the internships. Um, just try and get whatever experience. And if you can't get industry experience, Go get a part-time job in the hospitality industry. It all counts. Get some job experience um, and just try for whatever interests you. I gave some flavour today of, um, you know, some of the roles that might be there. Don't have high expectations. You're going to have my job in two years, though. <laughs> you know, be humble and expect to learn. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, sort of to follow up on that, another question that's come through is, are there any positions for research and development in industry and uh, what type of students are they limited to, restricted to in terms of qualifications? I don't think there's restrictions on those qualifications. As I said, Thurman Fisher don't have any R&D positions in um, Brisbane, but there certainly are R&D positions in other industries in Brisbane, you know, and there's many small emerging and I'm going to rattle off. So Luina Bio do microbial. You have um, Zing developing diagnostics they spoke on Wednesday. You've got Illum. Um, who else? I'm going to think. Some of the, um, uh, you know, Vaxis developing vaccine patches. There are opportunities that we'll look at graduate and it's about who are you as a person don't be worried if you get rejected from a role. It's because just on that day, you may not be the right fit for the team. They may be looking for a specific skill set, but there's a gap in the team that they're looking for. Um, just keep trying. From someone, 32 rejections, just keep trying. You will get yeah. there eventually. Yeah, wonderful. And yes, yeah, so I'm aware of time, so I'll probably uh, have this as the very last question. What would you say is the biggest thing you're looking for in a CV when you have a lot of applications to sort through? So number one, I don't look at them. We have a whole team of remote people based in Melbourne who do that. So what I can tell you is the best people often get to the reject pile if that CV isn't right. So really Google that industry CV. We are looking for what skill sets yeah. they will be looking for, collaboration, teamwork, um, resilience, give an example of how you can do resilience, i.e. I play in a sports team. That tells me you've got a release after work that you can go let off steam after a bad day and you're going to be able to bounce back. Also, if there are keywords in the job advert you're going for, mention those keywords in your CV. You're going to have to personalise that CV for every job application one to two pages max. And I have to say, I saw an academic CV that was 56 pages once. I threw it in the bin after I read the first page. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, thanks for your answer, Kim. And thank you to both yourself, Kim and Dr. Midwinter for hopping on this panel discussion. It's extremely valuable to students and uh, the session is recorded. So uh, I'm very confident that a lot more students will get access to this recording later 